Welcome back to Think Tech. This is uh, Keeping the World Company. We're going to talk today about the weaponization of drones and how it changes the battlefield and ultimately war in general going forward. You know, Ukraine has had profound effects on, on the battlefield and on war in general. And we're finding that out now. So for this discussion, my co-host, Tim Apicella, and our special esteemed guest, Dr. Rupmati Kondakar. Uh, Tim joins us from Honolulu, and Rupmati joins us from New York. Welcome to the show, you guys. Let's talk about uh, the battlefield in Ukraine. It certainly has morphed over the past year and a half, and it continues to morph because of technology. Technology insinuates itself into everything, and why not insinuate itself into the battlefield? So, you know, we see um, uh, Putin, is, you know, doing hypersonic missiles. We see the U.S. is coming up with technology that can stop those missiles. We see trenches as a new kind of World War I trench idea revisited. And now we are seeing the power of drones. And that is a mind blower because that not only affects the, the battlefield in Ukraine, it affects the battlefield everywhere. So, Tim, give us a... Give us a, a, the landscape here. The landscape, as I see it, is, and you you, you reference World War One, is that the drone technology that we're seeing unfold in the Ukraine Russia war is not dissimilar to the technology advances we saw with the uh, with the machine gun and the airplane in World War One, as far as um, new weapons of war. Uh, World War Two basically uh, bypassed trench warfare with the um, advancement of air tech, airplane technology, warplane technology, and certainly um, advancement of tanks and things of that nature. So we thought that trench warfare was a thing of the past, but now with, with missiles and um, anti-aircraft uh, weaponry, uh, we're back in the trenches. So um, here we are. And so what, what is the advantage now to um, containing against trench warfare? Well, it seems to be drones. Yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me is they make what they consider high-tech uh, trenches, where it goes at um, you know it goes angular, you know, it changes direction every x number of feet and zigzags across the landscape. And I suppose that's a revisit of World War One, um, but you know, in that way, presumably the soldiers in the trench um, are better protected. However, with drones, you can figure out whatever direction the trench is going. With drones, you can drop right into the trench from on top. So while the initial mm, development of warfare uh, in the Ukraine scenario uh, was to reinvent trenches, now um, drones are reinventing anti-trench. Uh, so I'm, you know, would you feel safe in a trench now? No, <laughs> I wouldn't feel safe at all. Um, not to mention, you know, we have um, the introduction of cluster bombs. Again, that's kind of an anti-trench warfare weapon. Um, so, no, I, I would, if I was a Russian or a Ukrainian soldier, I'd say, you know, get me out of here. Kind of a showcase, isn't it, Rupmati? It's a showcase for modern technology and how modern technology has advanced while we weren't watching. And it's it's um, and of course there's lots of technology at lots of levels, um, but this is on the ground. This is on the ground technology where people live, work, play, and fight. Uh, and so drones come into play heavily here. And uh, we were talking about before the show about who in the world is the leader in drone technology yes. right now. Can you comment on that? Right, Jay. Um, as we see the Ukraine-Russia war enter the second year, we are seeing advancements in warfare and counter-warfare. And this is a war, modern-day war, where we are seeing drones come into the forefront because of their surveillance capacity, their strike capacity, and the precision that they bring in. So we have something countering trench warfare, correct? So when drones are being uh, brought into warfare, you know, the struggle for geopolitical uh, supremacy never stops. So people or countries coming into uh, drone manufacturing becomes the key point uh, in the Ukraine-Russia war. And we are seeing Russia use Iranian drones known as Shahid. Uh, we have uh, Chinese uh, um, drones 
like uh, what did you say in the beginning? DJI. DJI. <laughs> so many acronyms. So that way we are having so many uh, um, countries come in play and uh, US restricting its uh, export policy is bringing this entire issue into strategic entanglement because when China supplies uh, the drones, every country has a fear that they are going to have this spying surveillance come in. So we are all wary of it and we have experienced that the Chinese don't stop at one point. They will go a notch up and they will uh, uh, protrude into our privacy and take in uh, secrets. Now, drones are something which you can buy uh, over the counter. But when we see it use, used in warfare and it, it dodging anti-aircraft uh, missile technology, I mean, it's putting billions of dollars of investment into nullification just by the size of it, just by uh, the flexibility that it involves. So we have a new kind of system which countries have to face. There's an export business. There's a commercial aspect to it. Did we ever hear crowdfunding in warfare? We never heard about it. But now when we want crowdfunding from uh, to buy for in Poland to buy um, drones from Turkey for Ukraine, I mean globalization at its best. So <laughs> let's get <laughs> or worse as the case may be. The leaders now, as I understand it, are China with DGI, which is, is as you say, can buy it over the counter. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, but uh, YouTube has decided that uh, it wants me to know more about drones. So it sends me these uh, drone un unpackaging, um, you know, videos and videos about what's available in the marketplace all the time. And, you know, what they don't talk about is the FAA. What they don't talk about is regulation. You know, it used to be that uh, to fly the smallest drone, you know, you had a get a license and you had to apply and it would take you a long time to get the license and so forth. Now, you know, they sell them across the counter and it's, and we're talking about a, a wide range of very advanced uh, drones, which are very high, high tech, both in hardware and software. And we're talking about expensive drones and that anybody, as you say, could, you know, could order it from Amazon or what have you. Um, right. So what, what's troubling about this is that these drones are, easy to convert to battlefield drones. Um, at first it was agriculture, you know, then from agriculture, you know, we have arrived in Ukraine at a battlefield surveillance. Um, but, and, and movies, you know, uh, take a look at any movie coming out of Hollywood or anywhere now, then half the movie is done by, by drones. Uh, the camera equipment on these drones is fantastic. Uh, it's better than, you know, and it's miniaturized. And so what's, what's happened is we have a, sort of the perfect storm, the perfect confluence. So, so Tim, the weaponization, and we talked about it before the show, are these loitering drones that you mentioned. And the loitering drones are as scary as they could be because they could be, you know, directed to a specific place. They don't have to come back. It's a one-way street. Can you talk about that? Well, the advantage is, um, well, first off, the, the Shahid drone only cost twenty thousand dollars. A United States Predator drone cost sixteen million dollars. So uh, you could have a one-way drone or a, a suicide drone, uh, basically loiter in the air, and you could have a lot of them. You could buy a lot of Shahid drones at twenty thousand dollars a pop. Uh, I think the number is you can get fifteen hundred of them for the price of one Predator drone, and they could just wait up in the air for quite a while, and then you can swarm your target. And I'm not sure how effective anti-aerial um, um, uh, ammunition would be to take out 1,500 drones. Uh, the swarm effect, I think, would be very effective if you really want to hit a particular target, um, because 60% could be taken out, but what about the other 40%? So um, they're, a, they're a very effective weapon of war. And um, if not just for the the one-way mission of, um, you know, a suicide bomb mission certainly is for capable as uh, surveillance as well. So, Rumani, there have been attacks by the Ukrainians of buildings yes. uh, in Moscow, that's hundreds of miles away. Um, what does this mean? And what are they doing? How are they organizing this? And how does it change the war? 
You remember the May 3rd attack, uh, Jay, when uh, Kremlin accused that Ukraine was trying to assassinate uh, Vladimir Putin with a drone? I mean, that was uh, the highest escalation of uh, uh, tensions that we could take it up to. And I think assassination at that level with a drone, nobody could prove it otherwise if the Russians had decided to escalate and uh, retaliate. So, I mean, uh, what they have done with this drone technology, uh, Ukraine, is because they have been going all over the world asking for advanced weapons. When they are not getting what they want, they have downgraded or upgraded their, uh, what is that, uh, options and tried to use what is available to them to get the maximum hit or maximum advantage to them and drones, I mean, affordable, precision, and uh, availability to the Ukrainians is what is the need of the hour now. So when they use this to attack uh, Moscow's buildings, uh, it was considered to be um, shocking at the beginning, but then now it is part of this warfare that has come into place. And you see, using it to your advantage against such a superpower, when uh, the missile missiles that they have are futile and these drones which they are like tim said suicide uh, drones they go and they when they come in swarms it's like unity in numbers so that kind of warfare strategic warfare we can call it ukraine is trying to use so that is a big um, uh, disadvantage that they're trying to get towards them Ukraine, as we know, Jay, through all our uh, conversations, is no match for the superpower. They are trying to make what is available to them. And highlighting drones in this warfare is only showing its uh, resilience to such uh, aggressive uh, uh, enemy. Well, you know, uh, the, the swarm thing is really interesting because uh, yeah. with, with swarms, um, you can attack um, a, a people in a trench. I mean, you don't need even right. need a, a swarm. And with swarms, you can attack a big ship, like a big American carrier. And, um, you know, in DJI, which is a little troubling because it's everything, the highest tech is in, in China. Um, mm -hmm. It shows you that we have a global competition going on. Um, yes. it's, it comes from, I think, I think Turkey makes, uh, and, and, and Iran makes them and China makes them. And uh, they're they're passing around the world, and they're inventing drones that you know that were not possible uh, two weeks ago, um, because right. it's it's a software play. The other thing is uh, dogfights. I don't know if you've seen any of the uh, of the videos about dogfights. So you have one drone, and you have a, an attack drone that's going after the first drone, and the attack drone is also a suicide drone, and it. It crashes into the first drone, and the two of them are, are both incapacitated. Um, so there, there are technologies, but it, it strikes me that you know when you have small and cheap this way, when you have a, a sort of a base of software to build on, uh, where you have a base of hardware to build on, you can you can compete. Anybody could compete. It's really become a video game warfare. I mean, what they have brought it down to from, you know, high technology control towers to a person holding a drone and deciding to let's go and attack this trench right now and let's go and have a missile fight and let's go and bring it down. I mean, it's become uh, drones have brought it down to the basic <laughs> level, we can say. <laughs> Tim, I saw a, a video of a fellow standing on a beach and out there, out in the harbor, like, five kilometers away was a cruise ship and he had a drone uh, gee whiz it was like a foot by a foot by a foot that's all it was and he, he set this drone to go five miles and and uh, find the ship and then and then surveil the ship looking looking at it uh, deck by deck and um, you know surface by surface and had it been a weaponized drone my goodness gracious what he could have done with that ship and, and then when he was done with it, it came back and it came right, right into his hand. He held his hand up, kamsa, and the drone landed on his hand. So, yeah. I mean, the, the technology is fantastic and it, it opens the possibilities for all kinds of new ways to do destruction, not only surveillance, but destruction, uh, including drone fights. 
I, I can't even follow it all, already. And you can see this happening in real time. You, you really bring up a great point, and that is you, got, you talk about a sole individual on a beach. What if that sole individual was a terrorist? So it's mm -hmm. not just the Ukraine-Russian war that we have to now consider uh, as far as drone technology, but the drone technology that gets in the hands of um, Al-Qaeda or, or whatever terrorist organization of the day is. And that puts a whole new wrinkle on um, how, how does a nation defend itself. And again, you brought up the idea that you know, our naval ships may be at risk. Uh, they're just a big floating target out there. And again, uh, how effective is their defenses if you have 2,000, uh, you know, uh, Shahid drones coming in and attacking all at the same time? I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not a military expert, but it does make my imagination uh, kind of run around and wondering how effective uh, our war, current warfare is or technology to counter um, this new technology. Yeah, Marty, one of the points that's been made is that the United States uh, is still doing big ships. And we, uh, I think we just recently launched a, a huge carrier um, that has, you know, every bristling with the jet fighters and the like, and the, you know, the best um, carrier technology you could find. Um, but the Chinese have these swarm drones and loitering drones, and they could accumulate a whole bunch of them and top that ship and blow it up. And so for a fraction of a fraction of the trillion dollars that's going into that carrier, um, they could destroy the carrier. Is the United States on the on the right track here? Are we are we looking at this correctly? Or are we, I hate to use this term, or are we missing the boat? <laughs> Jay, um, uh, US has to maintain its hegemony, right? But right now, we are just exporting to two countries, Britain and France, while the Chinese are exporting to 17 countries. So uh, even if they don't come in swarms, even one drone is enough to pick up secrets. You know, in warfare, secrets give up uh, the advantage to the one who has the secrets, isn't it? So this one drone can pick up uh, information which can be useful to the Chinese, which can give points of location, uh, vantage points, everything. I mean. Uh, possibilities of a drone uh, invading your uh, strategic space is so limitless, Jay, that we are, it's something like chat GPT, there are no boundaries to it. I mean, if, when you say, when you all discussed one person, single person having this technology in his hand and it boomerangs back, back into his hand uh, and it going into the hands of an unlawful uh, person, I mean, possibilities are limitless to the point that there is no regulation to this. Uh, yeah. We don't have national regulation. To, we do not have a definition for terrorism. When will we have a regulation for drones now? So we keep on getting entangled in um, the documentation. But meanwhile, drones have just crossed boundaries and uh, penetrated like never before. Well, I just want to tag on to your question, if I could. You know, I, I don't want to make the exact analogy that um, the drone technology has been lost from the United States to China, but it's not dissimilar to what happened in Detroit in the 1970s and 80s, where the United States was the car capital of the world. Uh, and, and then it wasn't because of arrogance, really. Arrogance of management to say we know what the uh, what the world population wants for our cars and we're going to keep on producing it. Well, as I understand, there's only really one main drone company that the United States military is relying on, and that's for the Predator drone at sixteen million dollars, and it's one company in uh, Virginia. It's you know I start to scratch my head and start to wonder once again to what degree has political lobbying um, kept drone technology to a, um, a technology that is great, but it's, it's not changing to uh, conditions on the, on the battlefield. And China has taken that market away from us. And not only have they taken the market, but they have now um, been selling that technology that they've, got, they've come up with. And it's quite effective, particularly to Iran, Lebanon, uh, to Russia, of course, and um, even in places in Africa, like the, the Houthis. Uh, that, you know, those those tribal groups are using this technology. You know, I'm reminded of um, an arrest last week that uh, that uh, Vladimir um, Zelensky made 
uh, among his staff, there was a woman who was reporting the, his position, his position um, back to the Russians. Um, and uh, obviously that was very sensitive information because they would love to assassinate him every day. Um, and they arrested this woman, and I, I wouldn't want to be her right now. Um, but the bottom line is, um, if she reports his position back to the Russians, they can get a drone or possibly a missile, but preferably a drone, to go precisely, precisely to that location on GPS coordinates, okay, and blow him up. So th the notion of assassination has changed now. Um, yes. Because of the combination of technologies that are involved in the drone, they have a greater range, um, and they can be uh, automated or they can be controlled. Either way, you know the the predator drone, Tim, as I understand it, is is um, not it's not um, automated. Uh, you have to control it. Some pilot has to sit. Mm -hmm. um, but some of these new drones, you just give it to GPS and. And the uh, the command control is very simple or non-existent. It just does what you programmed it to do. Now this lends itself not only to to fighting people in trenches, not only to assassinating leaders, you know, who command battlefields. It you know, and you mentioned this. It 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 really goes to terrorism in general, and for that matter, crime in general. And you see all these movies they're making now um, with all the violence and crime and all that. You can achieve. You can, and somebody's going to make a movie. I'm telling you, uh, you could achieve violence and crime so easily with one of these uh, loitering drones so easily. Um, and, and you can assassinate people and you can conduct terrorism as never before. It's not just, that's what I'm saying, it's not just the battlefield. What do you think, Rupani? Yes, it's the precision, Jay. Absolutely right, you are. Uh, the precision that the drones are bringing in, the surveillance that they bring in, and uh, the targets can be anything as you decide. It's in the hands of a controller. So the unmanned factor in it uh, brings this um, aerial vehicle, the UAVs, uh, as they're called, unmanned aerial vehicles. So these used in targeting precision uh, uh, points is now becoming the talking point of warfare because of the uh, damage that they can inflict, the potential damage that they can inflict. There is no boundary to the damage that they're given and the advantage that they're given. Like we discussed in this program before that Ukraine using it on Moscow for the oil refineries, the energy infrastructure, the logistics, you know, this cannot be targeted on ground. This could only be no, no advanced missiles because Russia has got one of the most advanced anti-missile infrastructure uh, warfare. So these undetected uh, drone systems are the only way that Ukraine could get into Russian uh, territory. So that kind of precision strategy is what these drones are bringing in. Yeah, and, and you know what? I mean, it, it goes both ways. Uh, yeah. you know, the, the guy on the beach that I described, the fact that these drones are capable of uh, long distances and they're capable of um, <clears throat> dropping in on you and blowing you up, it, it, it changes the vectors, doesn't it, Tim? It, so if I'm Russia and I want to uh, uh, attack some country in NATO, um, I just, a suitcase, it's not like a dirty bomb or anything where you can spot the radioactivity. It's a suitcase. You put the drone in the suitcase and you take your, uh, your assassin, your terrorist, uh, you know, into another country. And he has a range of, um, I don't know, five, 10 miles. You don't even know where it came from, do you? And you can have, you know, sort of a, a, a new kind of war, a new kind of assassination. And, and that technology is right here, right now, don't you think? Here's the question. How do you... What's the signature of a drone? How do you know who launched it? Um, you can have, you know, bad actors in the world and blame it on uh, Russia, blame it on Ukraine, blame it on the United States, blame it on NATO. Uh, so where's the signature, you know, of that drone as it does a, a terroristic uh, action against uh, another nation? So that's what I really, I, that kind of worries me is uh, how could a war start and the parties didn't even start it. You wouldn't even know. And yes. whichever way they were flying, you wouldn't even know. 
So, uh, Ramada, we know that this has changed the battlefield war. And, and as we speak right now, today, this moment, it is changing the battlefield war. It's the, changing the war where one side reaches out across the border by hundreds of miles and does destruction on the other side, where one side uh, tries to get uh, leverage to assassinate the leadership on the other side. Uh, we know, for example, in the South China Sea, the Chinese are organizing drone technology to try to blow up our ships. Um, okay. You know, and this is all happening right now. And the question is, uh, what can the United States do to keep up? It's very clear that we are behind the Chinese, behind DJI. Yeah, like the information that you gave for research, and we talked about it, Jay. Uh, the American dream, I mean, when you talk about the American dream, there are companies and in, uh, in the Silicon Valley which are developing drone technology, advanced drone technology, uh, which is now known as the Andrew, which is drones which go and ask the rogue drone, are you, uh, they verify the controller. If it is considered not in friendly lines, that drone destroys that drone, which has invaded their space. So America is trying to get its uh, position back by creating more, anti-drone uh, um, software upgradations to their drones. So this Andrew technology that we have researched about is one such thing which will bring America back into uh, the prime play. But you see right now, it is in mass numbers that they're manufacturing. Now we have to look at quality over quantity and look in you know a little bit further that maybe not now, but in a little bit of time, we can get the vantage point again. You know, Tim, you know, when, when, as I mentioned, when drones first, you know, got out there into the community, uh, they were, they, they seem to have very constructive uses, like, for example, monitoring your agricultural field, um, you know, uh, I don't know, check, checking things out in your company. Um, and um, that, that seems to have faded just the way FAA regulations uh, have faded. Um, and it seems to me that you know, what we hear, what we see, what we can imagine these days, just you know, using our imagination is that drones are much more dangerous and effective on the destruction side, on the war side, on the assassination, crime, terrorism side, than they are on the constructive side. Do you agree? Can you think of any major advance in the constructive side, the constructive use of drones. Look at, look at building inspections. Um, we have an infrastructure that's crumbling in this country. Uh, the use of drones to get in places and observe and document uh, would, take, would take incredible amounts of time for engineers to get in those locations to inspect. So uh, building inspections. Um, you know, I've, as you know, Jay, I've done a lot of traveling in Africa and um, a big problem in Africa, particularly where there's game reserves, is uh, poaching, uh, killing animals and, and bringing them to the brink of extinction. Well, why not equip a drone with uh, infrared technology so that in the middle of the night, you can see where the poachers are coming from by their body signatures, their heat signatures. What a great way to, to, to uh, you know, be effective game warden and use the drone technology. Um, there's countless, countless advantages to drones. I think the news cycle, unfortunately, is just picking up the destructive end of what drones could be used for. It's, it's again, it's, it's a press game. It's a media game. Um, but drone technology, like any, any tool, can be used for good or evil. And um, where I think our media is focusing on the evil uses of drone. Yeah, I'm just as you speak, I'm thinking, for example, you could take the swarm technology and adapt that into the search technology. For example, when the Coast Guard goes looking for somebody who's lost at sea, they have a search pattern. So you have a ship or two, and it follows a specific you know, method of search. It boxes out the area it wants to search, and it you know, crisscrosses up and down and across in a systematic way uh, to make sure it covers all of that area to find the lost person. But that seems like a, a real waste of money, doesn't it? Because you could send up a swarm of drones with cameras and sensors and whatnot, and you could have those drones systematically in a coordinated way search a very large area. And if they run out of gas or electric you know, charge, so what? 
um, you can check the area out. And this means, you know, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's watching cattle on a, on a ranch. Uh, it's uh, checking out a, um, a dangerous area of a city for crime. Um, it is, is looking at our whole world. And that would be the positive side. There would be negative things, too. But it's, it strikes me that if the U.S. Uh, really wanted to get into its favorite thing, namely software development, it could make um, pattern search, pattern, um, you know, pat sort of alternatives to swarm, maybe modifications um, of the swarm to make the swarm better, um, to, to, to know exactly what's going on under the hood. Uh, I, I, we haven't even started, have we? No. No. Yeah. Well, we're, we're about out of time, I think. Uh, I would like to ask for your final comments. Uh, uh, you first, Rupmati, where does this leave you with? What is your advice to the American technology sector? What is your advice to Congress? Um, how serious is this problem? Uh, how serious are the constructive possibilities? What should we do now to get a leg up on this? Correct, Jay. Right. We through the program we have discussed the spectrum of uses that drones are put into. And right now, the urgency of the R is how do we upgrade software and how do we reduce the cost? Like Tim said, one predator drone costs uh, around 18 million. So we need to put in cost effective to counter uh, China's print technology. They take one and they manufacture in print, wholesale, this kind of reduces their cost of manufacturing. We manufacture precision, the cost increases. So how to bring it to cost-effective terms, how to increase uh, to uh, develop software, which will be uh, protective towards the country and uh, you know strategic uh, support to the country because, uh, Jay, you cannot undermine surveillance leakages through drone systems. When you import drones from China, there are devices which bring out, uh, which bring surveillance data back to them. You know, every, every device that we use gives us a consent form. Do you accept uh, the data that we use from your device? That is the linkage or the surveillance that they have through small, small devices. That needs to be countered because geopolitically, it is very important to uh, bridge these leakages. Otherwise, you know, it is uh, compromising on your strategic uh, advantage or strategic position in the geopolitical scenario. So uh, drones are, uh, whether we like it or not, an important part of uh, the modern warfare. And uh, bringing this into a mainline um, implementation of uh, Congress laws and regulations, opening up the market state. There is restriction of exports of drones, so China is eating up the market. Exporting, allowing exports from US will give us, uh, uh, what is that, strategic advantages in the market. We don't have that. There are a lot of regulations in that. So first is reduction of the regulations. We have a long way to go and we don't have a lot of time to get there. You know, I, I was thinking, Tim, that maybe if I put a piece of uh, aluminum foil in my head, um, I mean, again, <laughs> I, I would be, I'd be able to stop a, a, a loitering drone from loitering over me and, and blowing me up. But, you know, what are we going to do? Because, uh, you know, clearly the, the momentum is in favor of China, Iran, and for that matter, Turkey, and maybe others. Other, you yeah. know, people who are, you know, familiar with, um, you know, the technology and the software. What are we going to do here to, and may I say, catch up? What are we going to do here to protect ourselves? What are we going to do to be a leader in this area, in an area which has changed the battlefield, um, the nature of the battlefield, including the naval battlefield, including the battlefield in the skies, including our whole world? What are we going to do? Well, I think there needs to be a realization that the Department of Defense needs to wake up and not become the Detroit uh, car manufacturing industry of the 1970s and 80s. That's, that's job number one. Uh, as as referenced, there are as there are software companies in Silicon Valley that have this technology. It's cheap. Well, it's not cheap, but it's it's price effective, and um, it's all about software now, isn't it? And um, those drones are you know are now 
having that software package installed and they're far more effective. The genie's out of the bottle when it comes to drone technology. There's no, there's no way we're putting that back in the bottle. Um, and does, how does that apply to warfare? Well, I go back to World War I, you know, the Great War, the war that end all wars was a war of attrition, human attrition, um, a quagmire and a loss of life. And I don't see the Ukraine-Russian war, Putin's war, being any different. I see it a war of attrition. And I think we have to get to our, our, our political powers and uh, unification of, of sanctions against Russia to end this quagmire, because drone technology is only going to extend it. Wow. Great comments, Tim. Great comments, Rupmati. Thank you so much. And you guys give me a certain level of confidence that we can get a handle on this. And I don't have to have a piece of aluminum foil on my head. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. We'll be back for more. Aloha.